Hey, this is a absolute delight for me today. Um, we have a special guest with us, Dr. Reverend G. Um, we go back in some ways for a long time, but you've been in part of this community and leading, I think, uh, the word is that you've been a pastor longer than any other pastor in the Madison area. Is that that's true? Right? That, that's yeah. very true. That makes me feel old, John. But I mean, that's true. That's true. I wisdom. Gotta prove it. Wisdom is what we call that. Yeah, that's right. I like that. So I am just thrilled that we uh, have some time with you today, and I get to ask you some questions. Before we do that, I just wanted to share a couple of personal things for me. Uh, sure. as, as a way just to kind of, I think, honor your influence in my life. Um, so I, before starting Collaboration Project, worked as a pastor for about 20 years, uh, first at Blackhawk Church and then at Door Creek. Um, and it was, I think it was in the summer of 2000, uh, we were, I was my first year of ministry and we were just starting something that eventually was going to become Mass and Missions, which is this like youth service camp uh, that still exists to this day, reaching hundreds of kids every summer. Right. Um, and we started off, I think it was six students. We drove around in a van and you welcomed us in to partner with Nehemiah and the ACE summer camp program there. Um, and I'm just, uh, that really planted the seeds for what has become a program that's worked with thousands of kids over the years now. Um, and I continue to be grateful. And just one anecdote that I want to share briefly. Sure. Remember that summer, um, we were all, uh, going by brother and sister, our first names. And that was kind of like part of the program, part of the conversation. And I knew of you, I think I've shared this with you before, but I knew of you, but I, I was, I was just starting off and I was all nervous. And so we were in the midst of the camp thing and I got introduced to, to I think it was brother Alex is how you were introduced at the time. Yeah, sure. And I like super awkwardly was like, I'm sister John. And I don't know how it came up. And then I just like blushed and I was like, Oh, I, I gotta go. So that's how I remember first meeting you. So um, I remember that man. First impressions, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then another thing that I just wanted to call out because I, I think this is I just so appreciate this is um, about six years ago we started something called the Kingdom Justice Summit over at Door Creek, and I had no business getting into conference planning. I didn't know what I was doing, but it just kind of started as a dream of like we'd love to bring Christian. Uh, community, especially white Christian community together around issues of justice and biblical justice. Right. right. Um, and again, we didn't have like a budget. We didn't know how to do events. I just been to a lot of conferences. So it's kind of like, let's try this. Uh, and both you and Parker Palmer graciously offered to be our first keynote speakers. Uh, yeah. And I remember our goal internally, I don't know if I ever shared this with you is like, I hope we have 35 people who show up and we had over 200 that first year from over yes. 30 churches. And again, I think just your graciousness to be part of that event um, really laid the foundation for something that's now gone on for six years and hopefully will continue even in the midst of COVID. So just thank you for oh, the impact you've had on my life and, and the ministry we've had. Um, it's a real honor. So appreciate thank that. Thank you for those reflections. I appreciate that. And that was Parker Palmer's birthday too. It was, it was. His people told us, hey, there's no way he's going to say yes. And then a week later I got a call and and on the other on the other end was uh, Parker Palmer. And he's like, I'd love to do this. I'd never hang out with the evangelicals, I think was his words. So right. it was awesome. It was awesome. But yeah. um, here's the first question. So I've, you know, as I've already alluded, I've been following you for a long time and in, in, ever since I started in ministry. Um, and I was recently just kind of refreshing for this conversation, looking at the Fountain of Life website, as well as the Nehemiah one. Uh, and I just wanted to hear from you, like, what does an average week look like for you right now? And then secondarily, do you ever sleep? Because I suspect maybe not. You know, and, and I'm, well, if you had looked at the Alex G website as well, you really wonder, because all my all my podcast episode, uh, episodes are there for Black Like Me. I've got like 107. Um, I will say a couple of things. Uh, I do sleep. Um, over the years, I'll, and cause that's easier. I, I, I require about six hours of sleep. So I try to get that in. Um, oddly, John, I'm a night owl and I'm an early bird. So I can stay up until, and I don't do this all the time. I don't, I try not to burn a candle on both ends all the time, but I can stay up to two o'clock and then still wake up at four 30 to get ready to go to the airport to fly out. I can't do that again all the time, but I've sort of trained myself to respond as I need to. But, um, but I can fall asleep quickly and I can almost sleep anywhere. So, um, so I try to make sure I get six hours in. I, I've never really done eight hours. Um, so, so I try to make sure that I, that I rest really well. Typical week, man, I don't live in a typical world. So it's hard to, to establish that, but I will say, um, 
typical week does involve my meeting with my leadership team because I have an incredible team, uh, both on the Nehemiah side and the Fountain of Life side. And these folks are the ones who really get the magic done. They're the ones who make sure that the content, the, um, the videos, the website, the training materials, the programs, the evaluations really, really work well. And over the years, these folks have been influenced by the work, so they want to be a part of it. So I say that's that being in, being in meetings and now Zoom meetings with these folks, um, creating strategy is a big part of my week. Um, and, that, and that ties into also responding to crises. So in any given week, there's a crisis. You know, um, if there's a shooting and if there's a thought that it might involve African-American people, then there are several of us who are African-American pastors who are immediately called on that, which is interesting because my white colleagues, to my knowledge, don't necessarily get called about white shootings. So, so that's a big part of the week. Um, clearly, ministry is outside the four walls of the church. So we're constantly thinking about that and as impacted by what's happening in the community as we are by what's happening inside the church. I advise lots of leaders around the community, um, whether they're white pastors wanting to understand multi-ethnicity, black pastors wanting to understand multi-ethnicity in Madison, Wisconsin, elected officials wanting to get a different perspective, and so a typical week is spending a phone call with a business leader or Zoom call or a political leader um, or, you know, someone in between. Then as always, there's there's the prepping of sermons because I'm still the lead pastor um, um, at a church. Um, I don't do a lot of direct um, pastoral care because I've got a team that does that. Um, but I'm always thinking large strategy. And I'm also part of a denomination, um, Covenant Church, uh, the ECC. And so I'm involved in the Black Ministers Alliance that's building relationships um, with the other ethnic commissions. So the Asian American, uh, you know, um, Ministry Association, and then one for the other for the Latino group and for um, um, folks who are Native. And so really trying to help the organization to live out what it means to be um, multi-ethnic. So, um, yeah, if, I'm getting a little tired. I feel like I need a nap just talking about that. Um, but that's like a real part of my... Um, of, of of any given week, John. Yeah, I'm tired just hearing. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, and I mean, I I love that you're giving credit to teams because I think that is imperative, yeah, right? To be yeah, able. To, yeah, nobody does what you're a part of as a one person show, and so. Uh, but I think that's to your credit too, right? The ability to build great teams and and have great people. Sure, and, and it's interesting, John. Like some of the people on my team were actually drug addicts when I met them, or drug dealers when I met them, or had um, ankle bracelets on when I met them. Um, and some of these folks are in positions around the state and they're appointed by the governor. You know, some of these folks I'll talk to and they'll say, yeah, I just left a meeting with the governor or the director of, um, of uh, or the secretary of corrections. And, and, and these are people that are not in my circle. And so it's really interesting. So when I say strong team, I mean, I mean strong team. I mean, Anthony Cooper just was just appointed by the governor to the board that oversees the state public defender's office. I mean, that's Kelly Thompson. She's Governor Tommy Thompson's daughter. You know, not only was he our governor for several terms, but he was President Bush's health and human service secretary. But yet, you know, Coop is sitting on a committee that oversees her. I've never been on anything appointed by the governor. And so it's really wonderful to see that um, we are an organization that focuses on urban leadership development but we also model it. And so when I brag on our folks, I mean that with, with, with great sincerity. Yeah, I mean, I think that comes through. That's awesome. And I know one of the, the areas of programming you have that has a great team around it is the, the U.S. Black History course. Um, and that's kind of the, the, hopefully the heart of our conversation today. So I'd love to just hear the Genesis story of how did that course come to be? And then how does it fit into the larger vision of, of, for you and the ministry um, as you picture what could be? Sure, sure. I'm, I really appreciate the fact that you referred to it as a U.S. history course because there's a focus on what happened to African Americans. It's easy to shorten it to a Black history class, which makes it seems like it's somehow separate from what happened in the U.S. And so, um, my undergraduate degree, John, is in African American history, and it changed me because there are things I didn't know about the contributions of my people until I was in college. Like I'd never heard of the Harlem Renaissance until I was 19 or 20 years old, and so. Um, when I wrote Justified Anger, hundreds of people started reaching out to me saying, I can tutor, I can mentor. How do you want to address this? We'll follow your leadership. And um, 
we didn't have the infrastructure to respond. This was just an article, it was an op-ed piece. You know, I kind of feel like Jerry Maguire, like it's just a memo and folks were responding to it. And so um, I thought, you know what, if people understood how we got here, everyone wants to move from here, but if people want to understand how we got here, it would then help us to think more, more um, in a more shrewd manner about our strategy. So that we're not just saying, well, let's tutor, let's mention, let's do something. So I met with um, Steve Kantrowitz, who's a, who's a um, UW history professor. And we met because we were both speaking at something at the public library. And we started shaping the curriculum. I said, I want white people to teach U.S. history with a focus on black history. I want them to understand the systems that were put in place. So we did that for about eight months. We did the first class and we had 150 people. At first, they wanted to shoot small to like 75. Second year, I said, let's try, let's increase it by 100, let's do 250. We had 100 people on the waiting list, 100 people for a paid course. The professors are scratching their heads because they can't believe 50-year-olds are paying for a course because they're used to lecturing to 19-year-olds who are tweeting while they're lecturing and asking, hey, is this going to be on the final? And so the idea of bringing people up to speed really worked because my idea is this, John, if we can connect the heads or engage the heads, the hearts and the hands of people, we can make a change. Madison is a very intellectual community, as you know. I've spent the last 50 years here, so I certainly know. But um, the understanding of U.S. history, the understanding of the treatment of Blacks and other people of color and other marginalized groups is really just a head exercise that many people think has no relevance today because we, we, we marched and we had King and we elected a Black president, so we're good, right? And so... Um, People thought that we were just, we were really finished. Well, at one point during our first cohort, a white gentleman in the 60s raised his hand and he said, he was in the front row. He said, you know, Rev, I knew that I've been lied to about your history, but I didn't know that I was lied to about my history. And now I'm scared because I don't know that I know who I am. So I'm finding out things here that I didn't know was true about white men, America, our constitution. That touched me because I realized that's the sweet spot where we begin to connect. It's not because people want to rescue Black people because of what's happened, but that white people were not aware of what happened, how, and what the residual impact of that would be. So I realized rather than dealing with thousands of people, I'd rather deal with a couple of hundred who have this shared experience of understanding U.S. history. It was also very healing for me, John, because I assumed that my white colleagues knew about the atrocities of slavery and just didn't care. I watched the horror on people's faces as people lectured and they didn't sensationalize, sensationalize um, um, slavery. It wasn't like, and then they took a whip and they built it like this. They just talked about the systems, um, the dog whistle politics, um, white people being able to just police black people at will at nighttime or whenever black people are out, any white citizen could bring them back to a plantation. Even if they were free, does this person really, should they really be walking in the streets? Um, so similar to what's happening in parks in central park and place where blacks are having the police called on them. Um, I thought people knew and they didn't. And so when they learned history and leaned into it, it healed my heart. Because I thought my people were, ap my, my white colleagues were apathetic. They just really didn't know. They honestly did not know. We had people who are history teachers in Madison School District and said, I, I never heard this. How, how am I a school teacher? I have a good education. How did I not know this? Which sets off another set of questions for white participants. I think the thing that became really special is that we saw folks who are Jewish, who are Asian American, who are Latino, who are multiracial, who started coming. So it wasn't just the US history course for white people but other non-Black groups started coming. So we have a one-hour lecture for nine weeks, and then we break people up into 27 small groups of 10, where they have a facilitator, and we process what we've heard, because step one of people becoming allies, non-Black allies, is to understand how we got here and how many of them have participated unwittingly in these systemic realities that have taken place. It's a very powerful process. I sit back and think, whoa, flesh and blood must not have revealed that to me because I thought it was a good idea, but I didn't know that it was a great idea. We now have taken a thousand people through that. The completion rate is at 86%. We've had judges, chief of police, elected officials, um, 
um, heads of other nonprofits, board members, CEOs of major for-profit companies, American Family Insurance registered 12 people um, to the class. And it became a community, a series of cohorts and a thing to have our eyes reawaken. And at the opening of our initial session, I, I, I used uh, a quote by um, the great American author, James Baldwin, and I paraphrased basically. He said, hey, white people, to the extent that you don't know anything about and use the word Negroes, Negroes, you don't understand yourselves or America. So then I tell people we brought you here under false pretense. You thought you were coming to learn about me and what happened to me. You're here to learn about you and what happened to you. Your loss of cultural identity, why you're white and no longer connected to European heritage, Swedish heritage, French heritage, um, Polish heritage. What happened to that sense? Because your grandmothers had it, your great grandmothers had it. They sang songs, they cooked dishes, they, 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 they prayed rosaries or prayers. It was, his culture was very important. And now you know nothing about it. We're going to talk to you about the America that was made wealthy and powerful through genocide of the Native Americans and the theft and rape and brutality um, of Black people and the systemic realities that excluded them from the very wealth they generated and how that has impacted your life and the world in which we now live. That's a different way of contextualizing it. And it has just been fire. Um, in terms of, uh, or that, that's a good thing, that has been so effective. I know that's a long explanation, but half of that people know that it's not just sitting up in a class learning history, but it's living history. So that when we have a full diagnosis of the pre-existing systemic issues, it is then and only then that we can begin to strategize for meaningful and sustained prognosis. But that can never happen without a complete diagnosis. The reason why we, America, the world, the church is where it is, is that we have not fully wrestled with the true diagnosis of where we are. Therefore, none of the prognoses will, will work. You can't heal tuberculosis or lung cancer with a throat lozenge because it stops coughing, because coughing is merely symptomatic. What's the deeper issue? Are we dealing with cancer? Are we dealing lung cancer? Are we dealing with um, um, bronchitis? Are we dealing with a bad cough? You can't treat everything the same. And I feel like we've been trying to give America a throat lozenge and America's dealing with cancer. Yeah, I mean, that's so helpful. And, and I'm so thankful that you've been leading in this way. And I know it's just one of many things happening. Um, but I also find it so interesting in, in the sense that I, I think these conversations feel like they're happening in some ways or shape or form all over our country, but you've been doing this for years now. And so, uh, I've lived it. yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But in the sense of, I think, inviting non-Black allies into the conversation and taking them into a different space than I think just another paper or another, uh, let's fix this quick, which is not, which I think white people like to do or try to do. Right. Yes. And you know, um, one of the things is that, that we noticed when Nehemiah was created, John, almost 30 years ago, we were supported largely by mainline churches, the Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, um, Catholic churches. And some of the churches that identified as evangelical stood back because they questioned how relevant was our work if it was attractive to mainline churches. That's not a good litmus test. That's just honest. So we found ourselves even doing great work for the African-American community 25, 26 years ago, there was still a power struggle in the white church community as to why are the mainline churches so involved and so excited. And so it's taken a while for more of the churches that identify themselves as evangelical to really understand. I'll tell you this. When people are sitting there listening to this lecture, they're asking themselves, OK, Alex, you've traced your roots in front of the whole world. We know that you are the great, great, great grandson of Reuben Joshua G., a Welsh slave owner who raped your great, great, great grandmother, Venus, and had your great, great grandfather, Henderson. We know this. Why would you be standing in front of a room of white people in your church sanctuary building coalition? What would make a person do that? Oh, he does have reverend in his name. It starts a question that we who are evangelistic, who want people to come to faith, 
you want people to wrestle with this. And so I remember, you know, during the lecture, I'll say, look, this is Madison. I don't want people to say that the good reverend is proselytizing. However, if you really want to feel what it feels like to be outnumbered, go to Latina festivals, go to Afrofest, Fest, go to Juneteenth, go to a black church. Um, again, I'm not proselytizing, but if you want to be around black people who believe in transcendence, who believe in building bridges and forgiving, a lot of them are in churches on Sundays. There's some black people you don't want to interact with because they're not looking forward to seeing you. But people take me up on it. They do it from an intellectual exercise. Well, you fast forward that, you've got two women who are in their 50s, who are atheists, who are raised by atheist parents, who converted in a predominantly black church and are in Bible study, in a separate Bible study for um, people who never understood the Bible. Then they're on a group that's called, that's called Sustained Solidarity, where white people are learning how to stand in solidarity with African-American families and leaders in our community. Hold on. And then a gentleman who is an, who is an agnostic. And so I, we have witnessed three white individuals, middle age, um, um, middle income, come to faith. I mean, like drastic conversions through this work because they said it was something about the compelling story of people wanting to still reconcile in light of all that has happened to them that wouldn't let them rest. What would make people invite us in when they know what we've done? And it makes them begin to ask the question about grace. And I'm, so I'm still blown away when I tell this story. We have two former atheists and an agnostic. I mean, that's who they were three years ago. And the two women who are atheists <laughs> serve in children's ministry. One is a school teacher in the school district. And she's training Black parents on how to um, partner with their children in their reading and how to use different tactics that aren't always taught in school district. But it is, to me, is mind boggling that, well, we believe that the service is the work of the Lord anyway, but to see the fruit of major conversions of difficult folks. And, you know, I've been a pastor for almost all my life, John. I don't sit around and talk to a lot of pastors who are discipling people who are atheists, a few, who, who converted in their 50s. So it's, it's, a, it's a, and it wasn't because we had the right, apolog, you know, you know, the right apologetics or the right kind of, it was relationship, it was history, it was context, it was place. And the history of the gospel was somewhat implicit, it was somewhat covert, but as you and I both know, the gospel can never be covert. It still, it blared this loud message, grace, redemption, grace, redemption, and it drew them. And so I believe that they're going to be evangelists to other agnostics and atheists. And we are expecting that God is going to draw them even through this work. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's awesome. I, um, that's a, such a powerful witness. Uh, and I want to touch more on the Christian faith community in just a minute. But before we get to that, let me ask one more question. Um, and it's just related to the work you're doing and, and the impacts of COVID-19. So we're having to get creative with programming right now. Um, and I know there's some thoughts that have been going into like, where does the U.S. history course go and, and what would you hope for it to become in these next maybe weeks, months, uh, years? So could you just share with us a little bit about your dream of, of maybe in light of uh, COVID, but like where you hope uh, things might go? Sure. I have to admit, um, in the past, professors have not wanted their lectures recorded. So we have not had the ability to really live stream the experience. Um, and that made sense. We want to honor them. Some of them, you know, most of them are tenured. One isn't. So we just want to, we just want to respect that. The other thing is I do post pictures of, of the event of this packed out church. Um, um, cars in the parking lot. We run out of space, John. So we have to park at Comstock and Park Bank around the corner and shuttle people up the hill to the church through our volunteers. Um, so we've always dreamed about doing something online. Well, COVID made that a necessity. We don't know if we can gather 300 people in, in January. We don't know if the, if, the, if the governor of the state or the county executive will allow that. So I feel like COVID-19 has pushed us to do the inevitable. And that is make an arrangement, record the professors, put the class together and offer it to not just 270 people, but hundreds, if not thousands of people and offer it twice a year. So my dream and my vision is to touch more people. We'd love 
being able to come and talk about this in person and break up into small groups and I can wander around and have conversations afterwards. What we realize getting the information and having the experience is eye-opening. We have to trust that people are smart enough, the Holy Spirit is wise enough to, um, to make it work in other contexts. So my dream is to create, a, to, to, to digitize it, to find a platform, a learning platform, similar to what universities are using um, as students are choosing classes and taking classes online. Here's your reading, here are the videos, here are the articles, here's a speech to listen to, here's a questionnaire, here are the guidelines for a paper you've got to write. Um, we want to do that to give people a meaningful um, experience. So we want to expand our reach. And we believe that we can do this because we have done this by creating a great context for, today, for today's issues and pain. So it's not just let's talk about history. Let's understand today through the lens of history. Um, we want to also build bridges. And so um, to folks in other communities, folks who are in the faith community, the business community, HR leaders, um, business owners, we want to build bridges to them by providing resources to understand the issue, because then I think we can all have hundreds, if not thousands of solutions when we duly understand the issues. But also we want to mobilize hundreds. We want to touch thousands. And so we challenge people to think critically. You know, um, we've got um, friends who own coffee shops, and so they donate a part of the proceeds. Friends who own breweries, and so they are looking at creating special blends or brews that can be sold in the pro that the proceeds could go um, to, to Black-led efforts. You have people getting really creative. People are thinking, well, can I teach kids to fix their bikes? Can I teach kids to code? We're not telling them to do this, but they're just kind of like with God and Moses, what's what's in your hand? What what can you do? Um, I could create a nonprofit that talks about these issues. That's what I could do. And so we want to mobilize hundreds of people who have ideas in an, in, in an effort to touch thousands, because we believe that if people follow the, stra the strategies that we offer, they will understand the issues. They'll be more prepared to build cross-cultural relationships and stay within them. I think they will understand the kinds of solutions that they want to align themselves with. And then we teach something very, very, that's very important to folks who are our, our allies, that allies educate, they donate, they affiliate. They learn the issues. They donate and support those issues, particularly ones, we're talking about anti-Blackness, that are Black-led efforts. That's really key. That might seem like a no-brainer in a community like Madison. Um, we almost have to fight our way to the table to lead Black-led efforts, strengthening the Black community. As crazy as that sounds, it's the truth. Then affiliate, volunteer, connect, read the newsletter, share the information. Um, so our dream is really um, that we expand it all across the country. We, we did a sample lecture with Dr. Christy Clark Pujara last week, and we had people in Texas, Colorado, um, um, folks who worked for um, rangers from some national um, forestry or national park, uh, I think maybe New Jersey. We had people all over the country taking this, hundreds of people, which shows us people really want to understand a history that we weren't taught um, because it helps to contextualize today. That's really helpful. And I, I think you've probably largely already answered this next question I have, but um, I just want to appreciate you again as a pastor and a faith leader in our community. I think you've given the community and the broader church so much. And I just want to articulate uh, gratitude for that. Um, Thank you. And as a brother in Christ and as brothers and sisters in Christ who are watching this, um, are there any more, I mean, and again, maybe you're just, it's repeating what you just said, but are there ways to support you uh, or the efforts around where you're hoping to take this course or even just Nehemiah more broadly that you would recommend uh, to us? Uh, that's a great question, John. I would say, um, several, I th I'd, I'd love for the Christian community to do a number of things. One, pray for me. A couple of weeks ago, I was leading a Zoom training with about 70 white allies and someone just Zoom bombed it, took it over, called me to N-word about 85 times, wrote KKK about 250 times, and then said all N-words must die. The FBI got involved because there was a threat in it. Um, you know, in a moment, I was able to use it as a teaching moment. We got rid of those 
folks and then people were ready just to shut down off the call and say, oh, no, 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 no. You want to be an ally? Let me tell you what life is like in America. Let's process this. What did you feel? What did you think? I got through it. But like 24 hours later, I was just at work. It's like I hit a wall and I said, I can't do this today. I had to get out of my house, away from my computer, go for a long drive. Um, because I realized even though I knew how to act in a moment because I know how to work in a moment of crises, um, I hadn't been called that in decades. And the impact of it, the residual impact of it was palpable. And I felt I was in a funk for two days. You know, people think it, but it also put a name onto what I feel in this community sometimes. The people were so, people cried on the call because you have to live with being called that. But they don't understand that where we've gotten with COVID-19 and police brutality, this is people acting out the N-word. And you heard it and were traumatized. I'm traumatized not by what I hear, but what I sense. And hearing the words, seeing them write it, put a, put a name to what I often feel in this community through silence, through, you know, through complicity or being complicit. Um, so prayer, but then you have to snap and get back to reality. Students have to hear that and then go and take a final, go and take the SAT, the LSAT, the MCAT. We, have, we hear this or think this or feel it and have to still compete with our white and non-white colleagues. And people don't think that that's real. So I want folks to pray. That's not the exception. The rule being called it, it was some bit, a bit of an exception, but that feeling of isolation, those folks are not just um crazy folks from an extreme group there's someone there's some they could easily be some doctor's child or future doctor lawyer's child or future doctor the judge's child or future judge or school teacher or coach or pilot or police officer so for me it's not just i can't believe this happened my thought is who are they and who do they know who else who else feels that way and where do they work and where do they live because that mentality does not live in a bubble. It lives in reality. It lives in reality in my neighborhood. It lives in reality in our global church. Um, it lives in government. And that's frightening. And most folks don't know that, just like they didn't know that Black men died underneath the heel or knee or gun or bullet of Black people, men or women of, of uh, police officers, that Black men and Black women die that way. People didn't understand that stress and microaggressions from being black or person of color in a community like Madison can cause microaggressions that lead to degenerative stress-related illnesses. So when we talk about pre-existing issues and perhaps folks with those don't get ventilators if they catch COVID-19, much of, much of that is caused by stress in the black and brown community. So prayer. Um, I'd love for the church to know that our mission is not just about making black people better and stronger. It's central to our mission, but it's to make everyone strong. That our mission is a stronger Madison for all. That when you're black and influential, people call you a black leader, which means you talk about black things, you you, you ask about black things. But I'm not called by elected officials to talk about leadership or roads or weather. And my doctorate is in transformational leadership. But I'm asked about black issues and my degree is not in black leadership. It's in transformational leadership. Um, but that we're trying to make the community better for all and that we can do that because I've had to live by cultural growing up in Madison. Um, I said this earlier, I want people to understand that our work is drawing atheists and agnostics to faith. Um, I said this earlier, I want people to know that supporters um, educate, donate, and they affiliate. Um, and I want people to know that the church is created to challenge evil systems, to love people, to show mercy, and to be the gospel. That what I'm doing is not extra or special. This is the best I know to live out the gospel. You know, when Paul and Silas prayed for this woman in Acts 16, um, and she had this spirit where she could tell the future and they rebuke it. And then her, her pimps basically realized that she no longer has the ability to tell the future. They threw Paul and Silas in jail because they broke a system that made them money. They freed a woman from slavery, but it cost them their freedom. I want the church to understand that's the gospel. The gospel is not just preaching to people in jail, but the gospel is being so strategic in breaking systems that it makes some people go to jail. 
then while they were in jail, they still ministered to the jailer. And so I want people to understand that we have a great opportunity to be the church and to be the body. And I want the church to support us. I give all that background because when you find out that we do reentry and housing and kids programming, people think that there's no spiritual value to it, that there's no theology to it. This is very, it's wrought with strong biblical theology. And, um, and I want people to understand that only the, that, that only the church is called by the Holy Spirit to unify and then empowered to do so. No other institution or entity is called to do that. We are told by God, unify, seek the good of the city. They were given the Holy Spirit to build the character and the capacity of God within us to be that, to do that. It's just, it's amazing. And I feel like we've had some church partnerships, but if we had more, we could do more. Sometimes we have to downplay the spiritual part because foundations don't want us to be overly spiritual. We really need the church now to help us. Um, and we can do work that becomes part of your work and part of your mission. You don't have to be in Romania because you support missionaries in Romania. You don't have to do everything that we do. But you can volunteer. You can financially support us. You can affiliate with us. You can read our information. You can educate yourself. But this is the church, the time for the church to really partner with us, a part of the church, in bringing healing to this community where folks really don't know how we're going to get out of this. I'm led by hope because Christ is our hope. Um, but we need a partnership to build infrastructure in a growing organization to create the platforms and to record the professors and to organize this so that people can take it. That's not our core work. We still have to clothe and visit people in prison and go to court with people. And by the way, because of COVID-19 and all of these, these shootings, we now have become this education institute. We're willing to do it. We need help to do it. That was a long answer. I'm sorry for that. But I, I don't really have these opportunities to talk to the broader church, John. And it's important to share my heart on this. I want people to understand this is the work of Christ. This is not some separate work. This is not political. I'm not a politician. I'm a, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. This is my calling. I didn't choose it. It, God chose me. And I would love nothing more than to have my brothers and sisters in Christ support this work. Yeah, please don't apologize. I feel like that was the best sermon I'm, I've heard lately. So just thank you for, for sharing. And I mean, even as you're talking, I'm, I'm reminded that uh, there's that image of family throughout uh, scripture that's redefining the family, right? Where we are this this new concept of being one in Christ, nor Greek nor Jew, male nor female, but one in Christ. And and so this is a family issue, right? Like you're you're my brother and and I also think about those who are watching who maybe think of church as an institution or organization. No, we're talking about like the people who follow Jesus, you're the church, and this is an opportunity for whoever identifies that way to consider, I think what you've already talked about, which is whatever gifts, talents, passions you have, how to, how they can maybe utilize those uh, in support of the vision uh, you're talking about. Uh, and I love those examples you gave, whether you're a coffee shop owner or a microbrewery, um, everybody's got skills, right? So Definitely. Um, yeah. Well, just as, as we close our time, I wanted to say thank you again so much for uh, just your graciousness of, of having this conversation. Uh, and I'm going to ask a dangerous open-ended question here. But just as, as we wrap up, is there any final thoughts that you'd like to share with those who are watching? Um, yes, if I'm just going to be honest, um, I appreciate this moment, this juncture at which we find ourselves. Um, I think that the Church of Jesus Christ that represents the dominant culture here in the U.S. has a great opportunity to step up. Because as we talk about history and we talk about um, systemic injustice, the church was very complicit. The church of Jesus Christ was very complicit. Going back to the doctrine of discovery, um, the church supported annihilation and genocide and rape and all of these things because it wanted the American dream. It wanted wealth. It wanted something it didn't get in Europe. And it also wanted Christ. And it really, it really wrestled. It really wrestled with it. For my ancestors who came here, there's a deep sense of spirituality and of Christ. There were churches, Christian churches in West Africa at the time of the slave trade. But underneath all of that heaviness of slavery and rape and stealing your children, there was a song that erupted. There was a message that erupted 
it was illegal for slaves to pray because slaveholders believed that they would then think that they were equal. They would sneak out in the middle of the night and pray underneath bushes and, and fall under the power of the spirit. And I'm reading this from academic sources. These are not even Christian sources. These are academic sources trying to describe being moved in the spirit, slain in the spirit. And they did so knowing that if they were caught, they'd be beaten. And they didn't just pray for their children. They prayed for the children of the white slave owners that they would be, that they would be different. There is a legacy and a strength in the faith of people who have lived under subjugation and supremacy. And I think the broader church has got to listen to the voice of marginalized people inside the church. I think this is the time to listen. I think this is the time for particularly white Christians to lean in and to learn. Um, and I think it's a time to understand that what I'm talking about is not a black call. The church is mandated to love, preach hope, and pursue unity. This is what we're really called to do. This, there's never been a better time to model unity. It's not just talk about it, but model unity, cross-cultural unity, and to work together because society in general, John's doing this like they don't know. I'm talking to elected officials. They don't have a clear strategy, but we do know this, love works, forgiveness works, grace works. Redemption works. The Holy Spirit works. We do know this. This is not the time for the church to be quiet or conflicted. Whatever we haven't gotten right, let's get it right. Whatever we need to ask for permission for, let's do it. Let's not confuse faith and patriotism or political parties. Let's pursue the cross. Let's pursue Christ. But let's understand some of the negative stuff that America bought into for the sake of becoming America, the church bought into. Sung Chong Ra, you know, you had him at one of your social justice conferences. He said some slave owners tied slaves to the church to buy its silence. So as we're experiencing a shakeup of the world, of Wall Street, of economies, of politics, of houses of power, we must be ready for a shakeup of the church because everything we've espoused and everything we've done has not been motivated by the Holy Spirit. And this is the time to get right before God, that we can become the church, the bride of Christ, that makes the heart of Christ, that makes the heart of the Father excited. While people are looking at how do we save our economy, how do we save our businesses, how do we save our schools, and it's all important, the church is wondering how do we save souls? And no one can take that from us but us. This is a moment to put our pride down. Let's understand history. Let's understand the silence of the church. Let's understand the division that we've supported. Let's humbly come before God. Let's pray for the church, for the world. Let's trust God for a revival. I believe that we're on the precipice of a revival, but not until our hearts are broken by what breaks God's heart. We're not talking about social actions and politics. We're talking about the mission of Christ. And if we can't embrace that together, we won't embrace everything, anything together. We can't agree on a cross. That Christ died to bring us together, to reconcile us together and us to God and us to a broken world. If we can't agree on that and allow that to make us one, then no political party or governmental agency or business effort can do that. I feel that this is one of the most poignant moments in the church's recent history. And we must lean into this like the people who really love Christ and say, God, not my will yours be done and allow God to shake up what is not honoring to Christ. And I believe that we're gonna attract the attention of heaven and experience a worldwide revival that we haven't seen in ages. I actually think that if we do this right and obey God, the creative ways in which we've learned to worship will be necessary to handle the, 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 the hordes of people will come to faith because of our obedience to God and our model of unity. Christ said it, they're not going to know you're my disciples until you love one another. He didn't say it just like that, but that's what he meant. Leave your gift at the altar if you're not reconciled, because there is no worship where there is no unity. And John, there is no unity, which means what we're offering is not true worship. I want the power of God to shake this world. It's going to shake the church first. Then I think revival's coming. Amen.
Man, thank you for sharing that. And thank you again. Uh, it's just an honor to sit down with you. I, can we do this next week? I, I, this is <laughs> this is so great. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to include a link for more information for those who are watching to learn more about your podcast, me and Maya, uh, as well as Fountain of Life. And that will all be below the video. Um, Absolutely. And John, there's a link that we have that's called What You Can Do. So we also offer books to read and book guides and movies and we really want to educate people because we believe that that's something, you know, study to show yourselves approved. We believe that that education will open our eyes and our hearts to just unique partnership. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And um, God bless. God bless you. Thank you for this opportunity.